Yeah. Having kids church, no kids church. We're doing kids church. Let's do it. Let's do some kids church. Let's send the babies downstairs with uh, Pastor Cheyenne to go ahead and learn something about Jesus today. Please learn something about Jesus today so that maybe when you get older, like 15, that you'll come back and be like, I love Jesus anyway. So that when you're 17, you can say, I really love Jesus. So that when you're 20, what, how old are you? Could, what, so when, that when you turn 23, you can still say, I love Jesus, even though I've messed some things up. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you want to tell your story for you? I'll let you tell your story. You want to tell my story? You want to tell your story? I can. Because if I tell your story, it's going to sound like gossip. So I ain't going to try to tell your story. Glory. Yeah, there's plenty I don't know about. There's plenty I don't know about, and there's plenty I don't want to know about. Amen. Mm. Glory to God. There's some things that, you know, uh, sometimes we don't need to share with one another. That let, 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 Just take it to Jesus. Hello? There's just some things. Anyway, um, good morning, City Reach. Like I said, I'm excited to be here. You know what? I, I think the reason why I'm excited to be here is because um, the reality of it is, is this is going to be my last time in the pulpit for a little while. Um, next weekend, as you know, there's going to be a water baptism. Uh, that water baptism, if you want to go ahead and jot this down, is going to be located. Uh, Pastor Joy forgot the sign-up sheet. Fail. But we still love her. Um, it's going to be at 107 Meadowview Road, and the zip code on that is 19607. That's up towards Burnville, um, and there is a long driveway. Park anywhere on the grass, and next to the driveway, uh, you should be able to uh, walk out back, and you can't miss the pool. Okay, um, I will put that information back out there for those of you that need it. If you if you have it, great. But if you still need it, go ahead and uh, and hit me up. Um, and I'll get that information back out to you. So next Sunday, there will not be church service here. We will meet 1030 at that address, which is Kevin's uh, mother's address. And we're going to have a, a, a baptismal. Kevin is, is, is our candidate. Uh, I, if there's anybody else, go ahead. Glory to God. Anybody else that, uh, that, wants, that wants, needs, or has not been baptized since they, they gave their hearts to Jesus as an adult? A lot of times uh, we get taught and, and we get brought through this, through church and religion and those kinds of things that when we finally, you know, we were baptized as babies and, or dedicated as babies, um, the reality of that is, is the Bible teaches us that baptism should occur as an adult. Once you give your life to the Lord, that's when you should be water baptized. Now, uh, this is what I do when it comes to water baptism, just so that you know. The first thing I do is... Um, those of you that have given your hearts to the Lord recently and have not been water baptized, that's your, this is your opportunity, too. Those that, um, and, and I've, I've encountered this before in the past, those that, that, that were, ba- were, water, were water baptized and kind of like fell away from the faith or fell away or just want to rededicate their lives to the Lord, I also open that up for you. For, for, for you. Um, not that it's, it, listen, it's not, it's not that it's wrong. It's not that it's right. It's not that you should. Or that it's not that you shouldn't. It's a matter of this is what I want to do because I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. And I accept that. So I'm not making, uh, um, as, as you already understand, water baptism does not save you. Okay? If you go in as a sinner and you do not repent from your sins and you do not give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you not dedicate your life to living for him, when you come up out of that water, you will just be a wet sinner. And still go to hell. Hello? I'm just saying. What's that? <laughs> Kayla, I've missed you. I just want you to know. I've missed you. So um, I, I like doing that. I like opening that up uh, also to those that would like to be rebaptized, not because you're going to get resaved. As you know, our, our, our theology does not teach that you get saved again. You know, you get saved once. Um, and then once you get saved and life happens and things happen and you have an opportunity, thank, thank God for his grace to always be there to pull you back. Truth be told, there will be a time where that will, where that will not happen. But as of right now, this very second, now is the time to give your life back to the Lord, to rededicate yourself to the Lord and those kinds of things. So if you want to be rebaptized, just go ahead and hit me up before you leave today. Let me know, hey, you know what? I want to be a candidate for that as well. Uh, and once again, if you're here and you haven't been baptized, and you want to be baptized, this is your opportunity uh, also for that. 
questions, comments on that. Yes, ma'am. 945 here at the church if you need a ride. Um, second, I, w- <laughs> I was getting to that part of it. <laughs> That's why I don't do announcements. That's why I can't stand doing announcements. So, um, so food, um, next weekend, bring a dish. It is a, a potluck fellowship, so bring a dish. We'll bring stuff out there as well. Um, and here's, here's the deal. If you bring it, it will get eaten. If you don't bring it, we're going to go hungry. Hello? Because ain't nobody, ain't, ain't nobody roasting a pig out there for you guys, for, for everybody not to show but a dish. So bring a dish. If you, can't, if, 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 if you know you can't cook, then have somebody cook for you. Hello? Don't poison nobody either. What? Or you can, or you can buy something. Yeah, pick it up. Okay. There's Casa Chimi down the street, right? That's what you're saying? Okay, good. Chicharrones for me. Anyway, uh, no, don't bring chicharrones. They get cold too quick. Besides, I don't think they're open at 9.45 in the morning. So anything that you do needs to be. Also, there will not be any electrical out, uh, out there. So there's not going to be an opportunity to plug in crockpots. So think about that and think what food is still good, even though it may just still be lukewarm. Okay, those are just tips from the chef um, that she gave earlier. Da, 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 da. What else? Okay, good. Faith Kitchen next weekend. Um, the sign will probably go out sometime today, but we have Faith Kitchen next Saturday. So as, uh, uh, if you come, if you want to come serve, if you need to come and partake of that, uh, that's our opportunity uh, for our community. I believe that yesterday they had a, a uh, the Spanish church here also had a food uh, a pantry, and they gave away some groceries. I don't know how much, and I don't know. I don't have the details of that. Hopefully they'll report back to me and let me know how that went for them. I think it was their second one that they've done so far. Was anybody here for that? Did anybody come to that? But were you, I mean, did you come see what was happening? Did you? Nobody? Okay. Um, it was a good turnout? Yeah. Great turnout. Wonderful. Um, am I missing anything? Am I missing anything? I got two no's. Okay. Uh, do I have a vote? No, just kidding. Um, ears. Hearts. Father, we come to you with our ears open and our hearts ready to receive your word today, Lord God, that you would speak to us. Oh, God, speak to us. Speak to us in such a way, in such a fashion, Lord God, that it will actually change us from the inside out, Lord God. Let us just not be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That everything that you would say to us, that that we would be able to just simply obey it. And Lord God, in those areas of our lives that we're challenged not to obey, Lord God, I would pray. I would pray, Lord God, that you would empower us and encourage us and strengthen us to obey your word in Jesus' name. And God's people said, and amen. As you know, we've been in this series called I Worship. Oh, by the way, uh, before I forget, let's welcome our guests. That, oh, and our guests, we have a couple of new folks in the house today. Uh, if you guys would just wave at everybody so we know that you're here. Guys, go ahead and make them feel welcome. I'm going to tell you. If that's, the way, if that's the way you make people feel welcome at a church, uh, I wouldn't want to come back either. So, Tim, please come back at least twice, okay? Worship. I think it's funny about worship because different people worship in different ways and different styles and different manners. We call that in, in a church service as part of the liturgy. It's part of the way people engage with God, and it usually happens in the beginning. And people do it differently in different denominations and different types of religions. We happen, we happen to do it this particular way where we come together and sing and we pray and we do all those kinds of things and before we move on to this portion of the service. We covered that a couple weeks ago as far as why we do what we do. But worship may start with singing, but true worship doesn't stop there. True worship can't stop there. As I've already quoted before from, uh, uh, from A.W. Tozer, if you don't worship... Six days of the week, you can't call yourself worshiping on Sunday. You can come to church on Sunday if you want, but you're you're not worshiping on Sunday if you haven't worshipped the other six days of the week. I want us to go ahead and I want us to confess a new name for ourselves, as far as who we are as Christians. I mean, we call ourselves Christians, we call ourselves believers of the way, we call ourselves believers, we call ourselves uh, um, a bunch of other things that uh, uh, that denote Christianity. I would like us to call ourselves worshippers. I want that type of tag, that type of 
that type of identity to stick with us. That we understand that worship isn't just what we do on a Sunday morning when we lift up our hands and we clap and we sing and we, and we bang them tambourines. Oh, God, those tambourines. Uh, or, 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 or um, I know. Sure does. But worship doesn't, isn't, <laughs> worship. <laughs> Are you done yet? <laughs> Let me know when you're done. When you're done, I'll go ahead and pick up. Okay. No, you're not done? Okay. Okay. Just checking. I don't want to interrupt you. Anyway, so worship doesn't stop there. Worship is, is <laughs> she's still going. <laughs> worship, uh, Doreen, you know, I'm playing with you, right? Okay. All right. Doreen's going to leave here offended because. <laughs> worship. Worship. I, I, I'm, I'm there somewhere in the thought of worship. But worship, we have to understand that worshiping is not just what happens in an hour, what happens in two hours. As a matter of fact, this, should be, this is a very small part, portion of what we should be calling worship. Worship should be a lifestyle. Worship should be everything that we do in our lives. When we consider God first in everything that we do, worship. It becomes worship when we go to school. It becomes worship when we go to work. It becomes worship when, when, when uh, our kids are acting up. It becomes worship when our parents are acting up. It becomes worship when, when you get cut off in the middle of the road. Listen, if you get cut off and you, throw the, uh, and, you, uh, and you tell them that they're number one with the wrong finger, that's not worship. You, that's where we lose. Actually, we lose our identity in that moment. When we lose our minds, that's when we've lost our identity in Christ. So if we're worshiping and we're actually considering God first in everything, then those moments, when we have those moments, we're able to come back and be like, oh, God, I screwed up. Help me not do that again. Help me control what's happening that's coming out of this mouth. Work in my heart so that my heart then can be changed and converted so that the, the confession that comes out of my mouth is truly what's in my heart. Come on, somebody. Am I talking to anybody yet? So worship. So worship can't stop there. Intimate worship with God breeds both Christianity and active believers. When you're intimate with God in your worship, you become bold as a Christian. It's something about knowing who your father is. Knowing that he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Knowing that he is the creator of the universe. Knowing who he is and then who you are to him. It's just bold. It, it makes you bold. Now, I'm not talking about cocky. Now, I'm not talking about being conceited. I'm not talking about any of those kinds of negative things that come with it. But I'm talking about just the confidence of knowing, you know what? I was, uh, I was talking to somebody today, and, and they would tell me about their situation. I was like, you know, I don't get it. But I do know one thing, that God is still the God of the impossible. That God is still the God of, of, of miracles. He still performs miracles today. Come on, somebody. Anybody in need of a miracle right now? Come on. Makes you bold to say, you know what? I believe God. If we want to reach our community as decisively as the early church did back then, it might be time to allow our worship to get a little bit messy. And I appreciate this church because uh, one of the things that, that we do is, is we get messy. And we get messy because we get real. Do you realize that life is messy? There are things in life that just don't go the way, it's the way that people have said it's supposed to. Okay? Things get tough out there. Things get dirty out there. People get hurt out there in all kinds of ways. I don't know about you, but I, I have not yet to meet a perfect person yet other than Jesus Christ himself. And even then, if you look at his life, his life was messy. You know why? Because he was involved with messy people. So if you're trying to clean it up, if you're trying to make it perfect, don't make it perfect. Just make it righteous. Make it right in the eyes of God. Let that be your worship. I think I just preached my message for today. Let's go home. Nope, got another hour. 
after the notes. I'll make sure I get you all the fill in the blanks. So what kind of church are we? Our balance may very well affect our reach. Our balance on how we do church, on how we, on how we, on the balance that I'm talking about is, is what we do here on a Sunday morning and then how we live our lives. That's going to affect our reach. Because if we're doing it here one way and we're getting all pretty and dolled up and we smell good because we, we at least wash once a week, hello, just to come to church. Oh, that's just me? Okay. So, but the reality of it is, do we live it like that? Are we that, are, are we that person? Because if we're living the way we're worshiping, then the reality of that is, is that we should be able to reach the entire world. We should be able to reach this community. We should be able to reach past this city. We should be able to reach this county. We should be able to reach the state. And I'm not just talking to us. I'm talking about the church overall. I'm talking about the Christian church overall. It's not just, it's just not us, this little group here at City Reach Church. This message is for everybody that calls Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. If we worship, if we live the way we worship, there would not be a problem in politics that could not be fixed. Hello? Because everybody would be looking towards God for the answer rather than to themselves. Rather than to their itching ear or to whatever it is that they want to hear or, or to whatever politician is going to go ahead and rub you the right way or the wrong way. Ain't nobody talking to me now when I, when I get on that bandwagon, huh? So, last week. What I am hoping about today is that this message, we care. We care. Will challenge us to look at what maturity of the faith really is and how caring for others can expand the kingdom. I discussed it last week as far as we need to get better in caring for one another. Here's the deal, and this is what I believe. If we can't do a good job here, inside these four walls, we will never do a good job out there, outside of these four walls. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking right back to me, too. There's got to be something that we should be able to do better. We care. I know we care. I know you care. There's no doubt about it. I think we just need to be better about being able to show it. I don't have the answer to that. Hopefully, we will find an answer together. Can I get at least one amen this morning? So last week, we started to talk about why we serve and why we do the things that we do. And when we get the revelation of God, when we get a revelation of God and who he is, his love, grace, favor, his blessing, his word, when we get that type of revelation, it always leads us to a response. It's very difficult or hard or even I would say close to impossible that if you get a revelation from the word of God and you know that it's the word of God and it's God speaking to you, it's very hard not to get a response. And the response could either be one or the other. It could be either a yes or a no. But you've got to give it a response when you know it's the Lord speaking. When God asks something of you, you only have two choices. Either yes, Lord, I will go, or no, Lord, uh, maybe next time. Hello? And you can't look at me and be like, oh, no, I've never said no to the Lord. Yes, you have. Rephrase. Maybe you haven't, but I know I have. God has asked me to do some things, and I've been like, no, Lord, you got the wrong person. You got me confused. With, you got the address wrong. You got the zip code wrong. It's 534 North 18th Street because I live at 534 South 18th Street. So you must be talking to the wrong brother. Hello? So it's just me. Good. We have stuck worship in a box of just singing, of just praising, of just clapping. But we come at worship by many different ways and many different paths. Genre alone, when we look at genre of music alone, that should give us a clue that there's a lot of different ways of worship. I will tell you right now, you've heard the story. For some of you that haven't, I went to a men's conference one time, and I showed up at this men's conference, and it was a two-day conference. I showed up at that first day, and it was an R&B, jazzy kind of sound, uh, gospel-y uh, type of worship. And I was like, yeah, the presence of the Lord is here. 
The following day, I was pumped. I was excited to go back to this conference. I came home, and I was like, baby, God's going to speak to me again today. And I went to this conference, and I showed up in worship. It was a banjo and some bluegrass country music. Is that, is, is that right? Blue, I'm looking at my white people to help me out. Is that, is that what it's called? <laughs> Y'all know something about country music, right? <laughs> well... So they turned around and were playing some country music, moving quickly. Um, they played some country music, and I'm sitting, I'm going, oh, no, they didn't. They did a bait and switch on me. And I'm, and I'm mad. How dare you switch the music on me? I came to worship. And while I'm there, and I just do this, uh, and I did this thing like this. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll just pray. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, Aren't you gonna, didn't you come to worship me? So why are you letting anything else get in the way? Can't you worship me through any kind of music? <laughs> I was like, no, Lord, not through country. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord just like beat me up a little bit. And my hands went up while the banjo was playing. I don't know what the, they, they were singing contemporary Christian music with, with the banjo, I guess. Because all of a sudden I knew the words. And I went in. And I worshipped. And I bawled like a baby in the middle of worship to country music. Well, I guess that's what country music does to you. But that's besides the point. Enough beating up on country music. When people turn around, well, I can't go to that church because, um, I can't believe that worship today, they didn't even play a single song I liked. So I couldn't worship today. Get over yourself. We need to learn, pa we need to, learn to worship past the music, past the sound, past the distractions. And if it really is a distraction, you know it's a distraction to other people, then do something about it to help their worship. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Doreen, I appreciate what you do in the morning. Doreen gets here, when she gets here, the first thing that she does is she grabs a broom and she turns around and she cleans the, 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 front, of the, uh, the front of the building. She gets rid of the trash, the cigarette butts, whatever's floated into the front of the church, Doreen takes care of it. And I'll tell you, when she does that, it impacts the way we worship. Because if somebody new is coming here and, they're, and they come and they see that junk and they see that mess, they're like, what's going on here? Why is it so nasty? Why is it so dirty? But when, it, when, when it's clean and presentable, it, it, it creates an environment for worship. Amen? We can all be a part of that. We can, you can see something that's out of place, something that doesn't look right. And you're like, you know what? I can fix that. Let me fix it. I can be a part of that. The day the air conditioner broke out, Kevin was like, so what's wrong with the air conditioner? I'm like, oh, dude, you know, the air conditioner just broke. He's like, no, what's wrong with the air conditioner? Take me to the unit. And I'm like, you know stuff like this. But when you know something, you can be part of something, that becomes your worship. Every aspect of your life becomes worship. So let's take worship out of the box of just singing and realize that we need to get in the box of worship with God. Worship then becomes a lifestyle, and it should permeate every aspect of our life, every area of our life. We should be just soaked in worship. Today... We're going to expand the idea and talk about how we care and why we worship. How we should care and why we worship. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to it. If not, it'll be up top. It's a pretty lengthy run of Scripture, so bear with me as we go through it. Acts 6, chapter 6, starting in verse 1. I'm reading out of the New International Version. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Gratian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Is it up there? I see some eyeballs. Okay, good. In the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, 
choose seven men among you, from among you, who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen. Keep Stephen in mind. We'll talk about him later on. A man full of faith and the, of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timian, and Perminius, and Nichols. Nicholas from Antioch, a, con a convert from Judaism, Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. If you have your fill-ins, number one, the needs were greater than what the leaders could handle. There's times when there are needs that the leaders just can't handle. And then it becomes a choice. This need isn't going to get met because there isn't someone to take care of that need. Are you tracking with me at all? Their worship had growing pains. Fights were happening, and the Grecian and Hebraic Jews were fighting against one another. There were issues. The early church wasn't doing everything perfect. It was kind of messy and wild. Yet people were getting saved and miracles were happening. Remember, 3,000 came to know the Lord in one day. Could you imagine what it would look like to just have 20 people show up right now and get saved to have to deal with discipling 20 right from jump i could i can't handle that by myself i can handle one i can handle two i can walk through those basics we can deal with all the other stuff but when babies come how many of you got babies how many how many raised some babies they're pretty messy okay Okay, if you didn't raise babies, have you at least ra raised a puppy? I think puppies are worse than babies. Puppies are a mess. You got to get up at all kinds, of, all kinds of hours of the day just to get them outside. And then if you try to put them in their kennel, they're, ar, 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 shut up, go to sleep. Ar, ar, ar. A baby's the same way. You change its diaper, you feed it, and it's looking at you going, uh-uh, it's time to play. Like, no, not at 3 o'clock in the morning it's not. Next time I'm going to leave you there with your pampers. And see if you can go the eight hours. Hello? But you don't do that. You don't do that. Why? Because you got to take care of your babies. We got to take care of our babies. And it's more than just one person. And I get it. If you're a single mom and you're a single dad and you're alone and, and you, you got to do what you got to do. I know that with, with, uh, with Eli uh, being a baby, it, there were times where, where, where all... All that happened at 3 o'clock in the morning was me go like this, hey. Yeah. It's crying again. Your son wants something. It was always her son. Up until he messes up, now he's my son. Believers back then were thrown in prison. They were threatened. They were beaten. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they also they were baptized. Isn't that amazing? That in the midst of all of that and all, the, and all the drama and all the trauma, believers were still going through it. And this is why I say with this, stop looking for the perfect church. Stop looking for the perfect church because you're not going to find it. And if you do find it, if you do find it, please don't go there and ruin it. I told you, I'm not going to be the pulpit for a while, so I'm going to have all the fun I can have. When you have a church that's going somewhere and doing radical things, it won't be perfect all the time. We do need to have some things in place to make sure that we can handle whatever growth God brings our way. 
Sometimes the reason why God won't grow a church is not because it's not spirit-filled. It's not because we're not doing the right things when the right thing is supposed to be done. It's because it's not a structure to receive more people. Think about it. How do we receive more people? Is there a structure to do so? Or do we just stay happy when new people come? When we have a church, I'm sorry, in all that chaos, the widows were being overlooked by the early church. The food, the, the, the food distribution of all things. That's like saying faith kitchen. People are being neglected during faith kitchen. That's what that says. There weren't enough people in faith kitchen to help to distribute the food. Hmm. Does that happen, Julie? Hello? But it's not a matter of we make it work. God makes it work. But we need to make it work. He put us here to make it work. And that's just one, one portion of it. We went from uh, uh, almost an every weekend type of faith kitchen to just once a month. Because we couldn't do it on ourselves. We couldn't do it by ourselves. And I get it. We work. We have jobs. Not everybody can be making a, a, a food bank run at, uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. I get it. You know. But that's just an, one example. How do we then make it better how do we take care of those kinds of things when they saw the problem they didn't ignore it and the leaders didn't take an ex and the leaders didn't take on extra responsibility number two everyday believers were placed into everyday ministry i believe that god still takes ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Let me say it again. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. The moment you think you can't be used is the moment. It, it, it's that moment when you say those words that you need to repent and you need to turn around and say, well, yes, God can use me. In what, in what fashion, in what capacity? Well, you know what? You grow into it. I've had, I've had people, I've had uh, kids in, in, in our sanctuary that want to be pastors. Okay, you want to be pastors? Okay, take out the trash. Well, I don't want to take out the trash. Well, then you can't be a pastor. Hello? Go clean the toilet. Oh, clean the toilet. You know the amount of people that go in? Yeah, that's why it needs to be cleaned. Hello? Sometimes we've got to start serving. In the little things. In the what needs to be done. Instead of, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe pastor didn't take care of that. Yeah, neither can I. Your pastor ain't going to take care of it. Not when we have people that can. Not when your pastors, all of your pastors here, are already extended. Some a little bit more overextended. Everyday believers were placed into everyday ministry. There is not there is not a person in here that isn't capable and able to do what God's called you to do. You may have to take some steps first. You know, I remember uh, when we had the, uh, the recovery home, I had people that would come and be like, oh, I see the great things you're doing with the men's recovery home. We want to open up a women's recovery home. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what we want to do too. Oh, I believe God sent me to you to do that. Oh, glory to God. Well, the only thing I ask is, do you think you can show yourself faithful by coming to church here? To be part of what God is doing here? And if you can do that for a period of time, then let's do it. Yeah, I can do that. I believe God's called me to City Beach Church. I can tell you that in the, f we've been here at City Beach now eight years, seven years, seven years, seven, okay. We've been here at City Beach Church. In those seven years, I've had four different people, four different females approach me about opening up a women's recovery home in the first four years when we were still doing the men's home. Not one of them lasted more than three weeks. How am I supposed to then entrust you in something as huge as running a woman's home for this church when I can't even entrust you to show up 
show up, t- uh, show up on time for church. Amen? Scripture's clear. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in the little thing. And whatever that little thing is that you're supposed to do. Because once you're faithful in those little things, then you can be entrusted into a whole lot more. And that's not just, and that's just not in the natural. That's in the supernatural. You know, some of, some of us out here, you know, are, are, are praying and hoping for um, uh, the lottery. Why would, you, why would you think that you would win, say, a million dollars just given to you when you can't even be faithful with a hundred dollars that you already have? Nobody wants to talk to me now. Hello? What's the first? I mean, if, if I reached in my pocket right now, do I? I don't have, <laughs> that's why I don't have any money because I just give it away. If I, if I threw out $100 and said, here, go do something with this $100, what would you do with it? No, don't tell me. But think about it. What would you do with it? Because you know those pastelillos next door are only $1.50, right? Is that right? $1.50? Kadre, what are they? $1 or $1.50? A dollar fifty? Kadre knows, because he gets a dollar fifty, that's exactly where he's going. Too many times the perception in church is that the work of the ministry is up to the pastor and the staff. Look at who Jesus picked as his twelve disciples. They were a picture of ordinary. Actually, they were a picture of less than ordinary. Because if you've sat through um, any of my teaching as far as the disciples go, you would understand that these were teenagers that had been rejected. These were teenagers that were, that were overlooked for, the, for, the, for a pastoral ministry. They wanted to be rabbis. They wanted to be teachers of the law. But they didn't make the cut. And Jesus still picked them. The disciples were a model of who Jesus wanted to take on his role and responsibility, that he wanted to take on his role and responsibility of ministry after he left. He wants us. He gave it to us, the ordinary, to do extraordinary things. Trust me. If you can do it on your own, then you don't need the power of God to do it. It's those things that you can't do on your own that you need God's help. I can't do this on my own. I'm not smart enough, I'm not equipped enough, I'm not intelligent enough, and I'm surely not patient enough to do this ministry. And then there's God. And I can sit with some of you and cry with some of you, and I can pray with some of you. And I can help you when I can help you, some of you. But me? This is so outside of my my, my, my comfort zone. I'd rather send you to Julie or Pastor Joy. And be like, okay, go see them. They'll take care of you. Hello? I'm glad nobody said amen to that. Listen to, listen to how different Acts 6.3. Listen to Acts 6.3 here. Seven men of good and attested character and repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That's the amplified version. Now listen to it out of the message. It says, seven men whom everyone trusts. Or the New Living Translation says, seven men who were all respected. You know, uh, uh, and, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but, but, but I'm going to bring it up. Uh, Dealey, Danny Lee, comes to me. Daniel comes to me today. He's like, oh, pastor, I want to do this thing on Friday night. We should do a worship night on Friday night. I'm like, yes, we should. Let's talk about it. Are you going to make an announcement about it? No. We need to talk about it. Hello? Not to pick on him, but I'm going to anyway because he's here today. I think that's as far as I'm going to pick. Do you, do you understand? So, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. Let's, whatever we got to do, let's do it. But let's show ourselves faithful in the little things first. And the, the real basic stuff. Because if not, then how... How, how are we supposed to just take a chance on you? I give you a hundred dollars. What are you going to do with it? 
Acts 6, 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Stephen, I love Stephen. Okay, he was the first board member. He was the first deacon of the church. And he was a man full of God, grace and power. And one of the things he did was wait on tables. That was one of his responsibilities. The signs, the wonders, and the miracles were, were, were an added bonus. But his first job was a deacon to serve tables. Stephen was basically a waiter. When we serve, care and worship by putting action to our faith, we can do it supernaturally. You know what's real funny that I, and I don't know that I've shared this with anybody. Um, one of the reasons why I really enjoy Ubering, I also, um, I enjoy waiting on tables. If I could, listen, if I could make enough money to support my family by being a waiter, I would be a waiter. Because I love doing that. There's something about helping somebody along and, and, bring, and, and, and serving them that I really do enjoy. I also like doing it like one at a time too. Hello? I enjoy that. that was, maybe that was because it was my first job when I was 17. Okay, I was a busboy and then became a waiter. I love doing that. And it's something about being able to do it. When I get a waiter or a waitress that, 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 uh, uh, that, that helps me at a restaurant and they're loving their job, I'm like, wow, I want to be you. I love tipping people like that, don't you? When they're all about helping you, it's like, yeah, 10%, 15%, 20%, here, 100%. Take a t big tip. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into a wonderful light. We should see where we're at because in the Old Testament, only the priests could serve. In the New Testament, the veil has been torn and we are all called to serve. We're all called to serve. Number three, they cared. They cared for those who could give nothing back to the church. Do you know what it is? And, and, and you know, maybe this goes into making... Uh, uh, to, to the back office of, of how churches run or whatever. But I, I, get, I get this thing in my stomach and, and, and it just like makes me want to throw up when I hear about marketing ploys for churches to attract people. And I get it. I, I think we should be, be using those type of tools and those kinds of things. But it, 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 it makes me uncomfortable when the reason why we're going out for a specific demographic or a specific group of people is because of what they can do for the church no keep me right here keep me right here right, right, right where we're at because whoever walks through those doors whoever comes through those doors i'm not expecting a thing from you except for you to get closer to god i do have that expectation i have an expectation that when you come through these doors that you're going to meet god that you're going to give your life to god that you're going to serve god that you're going to be better off because of god that you, heaven's going to be your home and we're going to be able to celebrate it together that's my expectation for you from you when you come through these doors everything else my father something about an owner of a thousand hills and the cattle that are on it hello Something about having everything in control and being the God that created everything and being able to, to handle all of our issues. and I, That's the God I serve. So that's one of the reasons, that, and, and, and I declare this and I say this, and I'm proud. And yes, I'm proud to say this. I will boast about this because I'm proud that we are able to, to continue. We've done, been doing it for almost a year now with the offering baskets in the front and in the back. And we don't pass those things around. I mean, think about it. Every church you go to, here comes the usher. Right? I know that that is the most uncomfortable feeling even when I visit churches. Give me something. No. You can prepare to give. You already know. And, and, and we will have biblical, more biblical teaching on giving. That's part of our stewardship. That's part of the gospel. 
But there's no, there, there's no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play a sad closing video f- to go ahead and pull on your heartstrings so I can go ahead and pull on your, uh, on your wallet. What good is that? And what good is that to you? It's not what people can do or give. We don't go after those folks. We go, we go with the mindset of, you know what? Come, worship. Grow closer to God. When you're ready to, when you're ready to do whatever it is that, you, that God has called you to do, what your biblical responsibility is to do, God will reveal that to you, and you'll do it. This, this doesn't have to be a, a, a beg session. You know, yes, will we have... Will we have campaigns where we need to raise money for certain things, like for Faith Kitchen? Yes, of course we'll have those things, so that people can go ahead and get connected to those things. Absolutely. But I'm not going to play a, a, a video of some uh, kids on the street of Dominican Republic just so you can go ahead and, and, and uh, in the country of Dominican Republic, I mean in, in the countryside of Dominican Republic, because some of those kids in Santo Domingo living really good. But that, those are besides the point. I'll, I'll take it to the deep woods of so, so that I can go ahead and, and show you the little naked babies with, with all kinds of fleas and flies flying all, all over them so you can go ahead and give to that. No, I'm not going to do that. The, they cared for those who could give nothing. They cared for those that could give nothing back to the church. Who has overlooked the widows? Their goal was to include everyone on their journey. They didn't want to leave anyone behind. Our natural inclination is to be in the front, to go fast, to go get there, to go get done. And in the process, we leave people behind. I hope that's not our mentality. I hope that's not our mindset. Yes, I'm going to heaven, and I'm trying to take as many people as I can with me. No, that's not a jihad statement. Sorry. Some of you got that, so I thought it was funny. New rules. We don't win until we get our whole team across the line. We don't win until we get our whole team across the line. We have to have a mindset of no one's going to get left behind. We have to have that inclination. We have to be able to turn around. And, and like I said last week, whoever, hey, talk to somebody. You see somebody missing, reach out to that somebody. We don't have to organize it. We don't have to make it, make, make it a process or a thing. But somebody's missing today, reach out and say, hey, you know what? I know she was missing. Are you okay? Or if they've been missing for a couple weeks, hey, look, missed you. Is there something I can pray for you about? We don't have to ask the why you weren't in church. Why? They have reasons. Maybe it was a bad day. Anybody ever hear something from a migraine? Real migraines? Like the ones that, that, that just, yeah. Well, guess what? When you get one of those, you ain't going nowhere there's daylight. Hello? And the last thing you want to do is hear me on a podcast. I get it. New rules. We don't win until we get across, until we get the whole team across the line. Churches across America are living selfishly, forgetting about the weaker, younger, slower. Their mindset, there's a mindset that believes we are the mature and the brave few men and women, and we will forge ahead at whatever cost. This is wrong. It's up to us to help each other get across the finish line. Let's go in. We're going to review this diagram. And there's big circles. We have multiple colors in the circle. The outside represents people in the lost world. Then it moves forward into unbeliever or uh, immature believer. So you get people that are lost. They come, they get connected with the church, and they become immature believers or are still trying to find God. The darker blue, the growing believer, that's, that's most of us right now. Where we're growing in our, in our faith, we're growing in, 
in what we believe. And then mature believers. We'll talk about those as well. If you look at, uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, and I'm going to pull out a second just so that I make sure that we're running in tangent with the PowerPoint. Go to the next screen. Keep going. Okay. Core driven. When a church that is full of only mature believers are core driven. Usually the numbers are small. We're unbalanced. Little evangelism or outreach. We're strong and long teaching. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I, had a, I, I had my issues with this. Because we teach good up in here. I think we teach well. We may not know English, but we teach good. We go, we're going deep. Going deep is the goal. And here's the part that breaks my heart. Self-focused and self-serving. Gifts of the Spirit flow freely. And we're decept, deceptfully, deceptly immature. In other words, we think we're mature, but we're really not. Seeker-driven, the other extreme. This, these are large attendance churches. They're also unbalanced. Their maturity is low. They're entertainment-driven. It's all about the show. Their services are shallow. The gifts of coffee flow freely. But they're outreach-minded. We want these two to be brought together and be balance-driven. We want a healthy, continual growth. We want a culture of spiritual growth, a culture of numerical growth, and outreach-minded we want to be involved in the community. That's the direction that we're heading in. Wherever it is that you see us in those circles is less important than where we see ourselves in the future. I believe that our teaching, I believe that our community service is leading us towards being a balanced church. Am I making sense? Am I on track to where we want to be as a church? Let's look again at the big circle. The outer circle. These are people in receiving mode. The middle circle. These are people who are still receiving but are growing and beginning to worship through service. The inner circle. These are people who are giving through their time, talent, resources, money, and experience. So the question comes down to a simple one. What is maturity or what is it to be mature? Jesus says this in John 15, 13. He says, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for his friends. That's a sign of maturity. Mature is living beyond self. Mature is getting up early or staying up late to pray and read your Bible. Mature is giving, giving up a Saturday to serve at Faith Kitchen or hand out flyers to invite others to church. Maturity asks, how can I serve instead of being served? Maturity says and sees a need and meets it. Maturity is living your life for others. Giving of your finances and your own wants and needs to help someone else. Maturity is stopping in your busy day to do a random act of kindness. We did a study one time called Contagious Christian. We may go back to that in the future. Because it talks about how is it that we can just do a random act of kindness. You need zero resources to do an act of kindness. Ralph and Janet, you are my king and queens of random acts of, of kindness. The way you love on people, that you're just out of whatever resources you have or don't have, you still find a way to show love to people on their special day and their special time. And we all, each one of us that has, each one of us that has received the gift from, from Jan, look and go, how'd they do it? How? I don't know, but you did it out of love. And that is appreciated. 
2 Timothy 4.3 says this, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ear away from the truth and turn aside to myths. The best way to describe that, that scripture is what ends up happening is that people get tired of, 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 of they don't get tired. They get disobedient to what the Word of God is telling them to do and decide that they're going to go ahead and wrap themselves around other people that are agreeing with them in their own little philosophy, in their own little myths, in their own little, when they already have been given sound doctrine and sound teaching. I still believe to this day that right teaching brings out right believing, which in turn makes us uh, turn out with right living. If you're getting taught right and you're believing right, you're going to live right. Hello? So let's get back to the text. Be done. The results then in Acts were explosive, number four. The results were explosive. Acts 6, 7. So the word of God, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to, to the faith. The word of God spread. The numbers of disciples increased rapidly. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Listen, when we're talking about these priests, we're talking about Jews. That became obedient and receiving of a Messiah. That is huge. They woke up from their religious mindsets and, and, and embraced a living Savior. Enemies of the message of Christ became advocates. Look at Paul. Paul was an enemy of the church. And yet became one of the largest advocates that we know. Caring about people caused the kingdom to expand. Caring about people caused the kingdom to expand. Let's, let's bring it down a little bit. Caring about people will cause this church to expand. And it's not just about the numbers. Are you tracking with me at all yet? What could happen when we reach out beyond ourselves? What could happen? And here's your challenge. Will you dare to care? Would you dare to, to and, and just a, a simple, random act of kindness? Luke 15.4 says this. Suppose one of you had 100 sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls all his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over a sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let's go after our lost kids. Let's go after the one that is far from God. Let's go after a people that are dying out there and in need of Jesus. You see them every day. What are we doing? To open up and say, you know, I may not have the answer. My pastor is kind of mean. But at least Jesus I know. Hello? I don't know the answer, but I know he that does. Let's passionately pursue reaching the lost and the unchurched. If we aren't reaching lost people, then we aren't fulfilling our purpose and our and the, and the Great Commission. We're just not doing it. We must have a culture that embraces those without Christ. And I'll put it out there to you. 
And maybe we need to, to, form, maybe we need to have uh, some meetings and talk about this. But how do we get better with that? Uh, what is it that we can do in this church to create a culture for that? I'm not talking about dumbing down the word. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about those kinds of things that, 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 that make it pretty. But what could we do? What could we do better that we can embrace this culture that doesn't have Christ? We cannot win the lost if they don't ever come to church. We can't reach the lost if we can't get them into the church. Most of us aren't evangelists. Aren't evangelists. We can do the work of the evangelists, but most of us aren't evangelists. The other thing, we can't reach the lost if they're not coming to church. And how can we re- reach the lost if we're not coming to church? That's the reality. And that's why we're having a water baptism next Sunday, and I won't be in the pulpit for a while, so that way you can bring your friends. 2 Peter 3, and I'll be done. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I used to read that, that phrase as if it was being written to non-believers. Many of you, may, maybe some of you have as also. Oh, Lord's, Lord's not, not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he's patient with you. God's patient with you. Not with them. He's also patient. True, he's with them. But he's patient with you. So that No one perishes. He's patient with you so that you can grow in your ability and your knowledge of the word so that you can be effective in sharing the gospel and having and being part of not allowing those other people to perish. He's patient with me to be able to help through the hard times and the bad times and the struggles and lift me up to be able to get to a season and a time so that I could Share some love with somebody that will bring them to a place where they can receive Christ. It doesn't always have to be this, this old school mindset where you grab somebody by, by the shirt and be like, if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell. It's not like that. It doesn't need to be like that. I don't know how you came to the Lord, but that's not how I came to the Lord. Nobody turned around and, 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 scared, me, and scared me to the point of me needing fire insurance from hell. That's not why I came to God came because I was convinced that there was a God out there that had not forsaken me. And the the words that would just resound in my mind that he loved me so much that he sent his only son for me. It became so personal to me. And that's why the gospel is, is intimate to me. It's personal to me. Everything else I don't know. Everything else I don't understand. Everything else I struggle with. But I know that he loves me. He cares about me. And if all he's asking me to be and do is to share his love with others the way it was shared with me, then that's what I'm going to do. And sometimes it's going to be hard. So he's going to be patient with me to grow me. To help me so that when the time comes, I will be ready to say, you know what? Jesus loves you, and that's not just a hashtag. Hello? That was a good amen spot. Uh -uh, I'm losing this. Most churches only pursue believers. They may not admit it, but by their style, services, and actions, They have only put bait on the hook to attract other believers, not the unchurched. There are people that are saved that have come to this church and get confused by the way we do service, and they leave because we don't have a live worship. I get it, and I'm sorry, but we don't. 
Maybe someday we will. We don't have the, the, uh, uh, the, the 30 kids in, in, in kids' church and, and three children's pastors to minister to them and, and play games and, and, and do veggie tales and all those. We don't have that. But we, what we will do, the best of our ability, what they better be doing to their, best abil- their ability down there, is loving our kids into Jesus. No, I'm not going to threaten to cut nobody. But I will if I have to. Anyway, so. When our passion is to pursue the unchurched, we will attract them. But we will also attract believers. Why? Because they want to be a part of something that is making the difference in the community and the kingdom of God. And I want to respectfully say this to you. When I say unchurched, according to the, the terminology of unchurched, we've got people going to church right now that are unchurched. Are you following what I'm saying? There are people that are so religious in their beliefs as far as churches go that they go to church, but they don't have an idea who Jesus Christ is. They, may, I need to find a new word that we can coin here that says something more than just unchurched. Because you think of unchurched and you think of people that don't go to church. We are the United States of America. We are probably the most churched nation in the world. And yet, Africa, Africans are coming to this country to evangelize us. That's sad. If there are missionaries, I've met missionaries from other countries coming here to evangelize in the United States when we were one of the major missionaries sending people across the nation. Don't get mad at me. It's still the truth. I met people that can barely speak our language trying to tell us about Jesus. (laughs) What's wrong with us? And I say us, not just this church. I'm saying us as a Christian church, as the global Christian church. I think I'm going to lose a whole lot of YouTube followers on this message. But that's okay. <laughs> I didn't have but two anyway, so it doesn't matter. You get God's undivided attention when you become passionate about reaching and finding his lost kids. Why? When you fall in love with God, you will also, and put it like this. You will begin to love the things that the person that you fall in love with loves. Example, my wife and I. When I first met her, she had a son. Still has that son. He was four or five years old. Truth be told, I didn't want nothing to do with no kids. That was the reality of it. But as I fell in love with her, I had no choice but to fall in love with him. Are you tracking me? The things that were then important, the things that were important to her became important to me. Translation to God. I love God. But because he loved me first, now that I love him and I'm passionate about him, I look at the things that he loves. And he loves you. So if he loves you and I love him, I've got to love you too. Whether I want to or not. No matter how annoying you are. Are you tracking with me? Wait, wait, wait. But if he loves you, he also loves the lost. And he loved them so much that he gave his only son for them. And and then he tells us that he's patient with me so that I can love them too. And I love him. He loves them. So guess who I got to love? So it doesn't matter if they're white. It doesn't matter if they're black. It doesn't matter if they're yellow, green, gay, trans. It doesn't matter what, whether they, they, they love Trump or they hate Trump. It doesn't matter if they like uh, Biden or dislike Biden. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what their religious affiliation, what their background, political beliefs are. It doesn't matter. What matters is that he loves them, and because I love him, I have to love them. You can ascribe to that if you want. Or miss out on all that God has for you. 
if you don't believe that for yourself. I'm done. I went over, way over, more than over. Um, Tim, I want to lie to you and say, you know, my services don't, my preaching doesn't normally go that long. I really want to lie, but I can't because everybody else will tell on me if I try. Just remember, as my closing point, just remember the time, for those of you that have kids or maybe those of you that are kids, just remember the time either you were lost or you lost your kid in a grocery store in the mall and the state of panic that you went into to go find that child. Just remember that. And that's how God feels about his kids. And then just remember, if you were the recipient of that, what it was like when your parents did find you and how excited they were to see you. Just forget the part where they tore you up. <laughs> My wife hates when I do this. I can't do it anymore because he's 18. And he's got the keys to the car now. So, But I used to do that to him. We'd be in the grocery store, and he'd start wandering off. And I'd, like, hide behind in an aisle, and I'd watch. And he'd keep going. He'd still be watching. He'd be like, what are you doing? I said, he decided he was going to go, so I'm just going to watch him. Don't do that. I said, no, he's going to learn a lesson. And he'd stop, look around, a state of panic. In my case, I would be forced back into the island and be like, hey, kid, here I am. I think God does that to you and to me. Well, he'll let you go. And you think he's hiding. And he's watching you. He's going to watch. Like, watch this. He's talking to the angel. and say, watch this. Look at CJ go. <laughs> He's so funny, he thinks he's got his own plan. Now watch, watch. Look. Look, he's scared now. He's looking around. Okay, here I am. And he pops up. Just in time to just get rid of all those fears. And to give you that sense of security all over again. And me, I end up crying and running back. And being, Thank you, Jesus. Because just when I thought you weren't around, you've always been right there. See, I don't just cry in small group. I cry here too. Let's intentionally be a balanced church. Let's go after that mindset. Let's go after that vision. That's what we want. That's where we should be. It is important to cross the finish line together as a church. Just because we're trying to be a balanced church means, because we're trying to be a balanced church, it means that we leave nobody behind. Just because you think yourself to be mature and you get into that inner circle doesn't mean you won't pop in and pop out of that maturity circle. And it doesn't mean that other people around you can't help you. If you consider me in that maturity circle, <laughs> I still need help too. I still need accountability. I'm not perfect. So don't turn around and take your pastor and put him on some type of pedestal like, oh, he's got it all together. It's the last thing I've got it together. I'm just another beggar trying to show you where the bread is. God uses the average. That's why I'm here. In my case, below average. He picked ordinary men to do his disciple, to be his disciples and to carry out his ministry. Caring about the community will have an explosive result on this church and the kingdom. If there are other ways for us to reach this community or our community as a whole, 
And when I say community, community doesn't have to be the, the, the three blocks around this church. Community can be anywhere you find yourself. Your community can be your, 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 um, your customers, where you work. Your community can be the people that are, are, you're surrounded with as far as where you teach. Your community can be the, the involvement you get in, uh, around doctors. Your community can be, in our case, our community is, is, is the area where we work out at and the people that, that come around. Your community, your community doesn't have to be the three blocks around this church. This is a community, but it's not the only community. Hello? So just because you, don't, you, you can't come out here and start handing out flyers and go door to door or any of that kind of stuff doesn't mean that there aren't people around you that don't need Jesus. God has specifically placed you exactly where you're at for this time and for this season to be an impact where you're at. Amen? Please stand. And we'll be done. Next Sunday, water baptism. If you didn't get the address, um, talk to me before you leave um, or text me later on. I'll shoot the address to you. It is a potluck, so try to bring something. Uh, we will start at 1030. Uh, yes, there will, uh, yes, there is a pool, and yes, you will be able to go swimming. Um, if you have kids that are going swimming, it is your responsibility to ensure that they stay safe in the pool. There is no lifeguard there. Am I making sense? So it's a water baptism. If you haven't been water baptized, once again, need to be, want to be water baptized, please let me know so we can go ahead and get together and talk about it um, and make sure that you have an appropriate testimony for the water baptism. Um, we're going to start at 1030, and we're going to go until whenever? Okay. And we're going to go until sometime around uh, noonish or a little after noonish or one-ish, whatever. Um, but there will be a time where we'll just go ahead and be like, hey, you got to go. Um, and I will talk to whoever uh, folks I need to talk to as far as getting some tables out there. Do bring your lawn chairs um, to sit on and to hang out with. And uh, for those that are more fair-skinned, I would consider some sunscreen. There's three of you now. Actually, you know what? There's a few of you now. There, there, this, the demographic of the church is changing. Oh, my goodness. I need to go reach out some more. Dark, anyway. Where are my Dominicans at? Hey. Anyway. Um, I'm just full of jokes. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to stop pastoring. I'm going to take this on the road and become a stand-up comedian. Glory to God. Tim, you got to come back at least two or three more times uh, to find out if this is the spot for you. Um, it'll probably be best when I'm not here, you know, so you can see how it's really done. Would you lift your hands up towards heaven and believe God for a blessing? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Father, I thank you for your people today. I thank you for the word today. I thank you for the instruction that you've given us today, Lord. If there has been anything that has come out of my mouth, Lord God, that has been a hindrance to your word, O oh God, then Lord, I pray that you would just remove it from their ears and from their hearts. And Lord, let them just be focused on what your word says. Let us be a people. Let us be a church. Let us be a community. Let us be a fellowship, Lord God, that will go and reach out to the lost. Let, it, let not just the lost, Lord God, the unchurched, the one that is far from you, the one, O oh God, that you would present to us to bring to you. Let us be that person there. Let us be that, those people, Lord God. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would just continue to, to have an impact on each one of us, that you would continue to just bless us, Lord God, that you would continue to fill us and empower us to do the work that you've called us to do. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray and God's people said. If you received anything from this word, go ahead and give him praise. I will check.